Welcome, everybody, to Aonix Fortnightly, episode 37. Uh, we're joined today by two of the three co-founders of a really exciting new battery company. Um, although maybe it's too narrow to say it's a battery company, it's a very cool technology company that has obviously huge impact in batteries, maybe impact beyond. We'll hear about that today. Um, so uh, let me welcome uh, Peter Atia and Patrick Herring to Aonix Fortnightly, the co-founders, uh, two of the three co-founders of Glimpse. Uh, so first of all, guys, welcome to Aonix Fortnightly. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, very excited to have you. Um, uh, I think you it's only been a few weeks since the company has kind of publicly come out of stealth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think everyone's wondering what in the world you're up to. Uh, and so uh, it's a, really an honor to, to be able to host you here to, to talk about it. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction, um, but actually I would like to um, sort of pass it off to the two of you to share a little bit of your backgrounds and how your paths merged and ended up here um, at, uh, at Glimpse. Um, but I'll, I'll just quickly mention um, uh, many, many who have uh, many at Aionix or, or I think maybe even had listened to Aionix Fortnightly episode like six or something would have heard the name Atia. It's often uh, said in the phrase Severson Atia uh, <laughs> because Peter, um, Peter published some very impactful work starting, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, using machine learning al algorithms for predicting uh, battery lifetime from early cycling data. So can you take um, can you take data from the first you know 10% of lifetime and uh, plug that through some sort of data pipelines and, and sort of complex featureization uh, steps and actually get signal that can can be used to predict how long those batteries will last over the long term. So um, we have been following uh, Peter's work here at Aonix for a long time, and I know that that work has been very impactful. And so um, that's, uh, that's our, our connection with you, uh, here at Aonix. And then, um, uh, you know, you went from Stanford to Tesla, where if I'm not mistaken, that, that line or sort of similar lines of work continued. Um, and, but maybe you can speak a little bit more to that. Um, and then, uh, Patrick was, um, recently at Toyota Research Institute and, um, also has a really interesting background, uh, that, uh, took him through. Harvard, Caltech, and MIT, um, and uh, ended up with a PhD in material science, as as does Peter, um, and uh, was involved in similar work around battery lifetime prediction using machine learning and informatics at Toyota Research Institute. Um, so anyway, maybe I'll, I'll pass it off to the two of you to just maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, who you are and how you got here, and then we can jump into the slides. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Sounds great. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, as you said, uh, my background is is actually in you know more of the more of the physics world, um, and so batteries has been uh, focused for the past you know uh, ten years or so. Um, but I think I really came to this with uh, a problem in that it was very difficult to predict battery battery lifetime and and predict when batteries would fail. Um, that was when I got started doing a lot of the kind of data processing and data handling and trying to figure out like. Is there something here that we can we can look at? Um, and that was that was also you know in in the process of of starting to look at that how I met Peter and how we started working together and you know trying to pull all these kind of different pieces of information together and how do we how do we make sense of them? Um, and a lot of it is you know routine at least you know for for a lot of the things that I'm I'm working on it's. It's not. It's not the. It's not necessarily glamorous, but it's like how do you make the machine that produces the results that you can actually then use in a in in something that's predictive and exciting and 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 maybe a little unintuitive, um, honestly, which is the the cool part. Um, and so you know, continuing on with how do we predict battery lifetime and how do we predict battery failures? Um, Peter and I have been going back and forth uh, for a while, and that. Those conversations eventually led to uh, eventually led to a glimpse. So, yeah, I don't know. Peter has had, I think, uh, a very interesting like journey through the different through the different pieces, and, and maybe you can talk well, about the, the two of you as there. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I came to Stanford in 2014 uh, from the East Coast. Uh, when I joined, you know, immediately in the shadow of folks like Austin who've been doing ML for batteries for a long time. So you know, a lot of kudos to, to folks like Austin. Uh, around halfway, so I wasn't doing it for that long. <laughs> uh, <fair enough. laughs> 
you got it. <laughs> um, so yeah, around halfway through my PhD, uh, this sort of you know started talking about this project around using machine learning for lifetime prediction and optimization as well. Uh, this was funded by TRI, which was you know, Patrick's employer at the time. Um, as the project kept going, you know, we got our cycler and we started setting it up, and you know, we wanted to quickly and rapidly monitor what was happening in the cycling tests. And I set out trying to export the data from the, the cycler. I won't won't name the brand, but uh, you know, pulling out data from this equipment was not at all trivial, and you know, that's really where, where Patrick yeah. was able to make it happen. Um, yeah. For sure, the ML work that you know we published would not have been able to work or succeed without that sort of behind the scenes data engineering work that's really critical to any ML enterprise. Uh, so we published that work in 2019, a little bit after that in 2020 as well, uh, for the follow-up. Um, at that point, I had joined Tesla. Um, I joined the cell qualification team. So our role there was really to qualify cells before they were produced for mass production. Uh, I love Tesla, you know, great experience there. I think high level, uh, without getting into you know, details, two big takeaways from my time at Tesla. One is really the cell quality issue and battery quality issue is massive. And, you know, in my opinion, it's really maybe the gating factor to scale in gigafactories quickly and dealing with the safety liability issues that I'll talk about in the talk. Uh, the second is, you know, CT can help. So uh, we'll talk a bit about CT here, but, you know, finding these defects and finding all these problems as you're scaling a factory that makes millions of cells a day is really hard. And there's only a couple technologies that have the potential to really jump in here, and CT is one of them. So yeah, we started Glimpse um, just around a year ago, almost to the day, actually. Uh, <laughs> I think I think next week uh, will be to the day. Yeah, uh, we came out of semi stealth three weeks ago, I think, to the day, and yeah, here we are today. And I I really want to highlight Eric as well. So Eric was uh, Eric is our third co-founder. He's our CEO. Uh, I met him at Tesla. We worked very closely together on a pretty gnarly battery failure mode. Um, Eric brings a really strong sense of both the technical understanding and the business sense to the games. Great, well, that's a that's a perfect lead in uh, to the to the materials here. I'm really excited to hear about uh, CT and yeah. how that can that can help out. So um, I will just hand the floor over to you to, to go through the presentation and the discussion. Um, as always, I'll invite our, um, our studio audience here to uh, ask questions. Uh, which you can do through the chat or through the Q&A feature, and I will um, interrupt uh, either of you if we have questions, um, just to kind of keep it as conversational and, and casual as we can. Um, yeah. We have we have everyone here till uh, you know through the hour, so uh, it's, um, it's up up to you to to sort of take the conversation the way that you want. And um, yeah, over to you. Sweet, thanks, Austin. Yeah. Cool. So today we'll be talking about battery quality at scale. And then really we think you know, this is a mission statement of our company and this is really the key challenge or one of the key challenges to scaling batteries today. Um, a little bit before we get started. So I'm going to talk a bit about you know, battery factories on a gigawatt hour scale and battery quality certainly is a problem at that scale, but it's also a problem for small startups with two folks that are years away from high volume production. So this affects the entire battery value chain, uh, not just the, the high throughput side. Just want to make that clear from the start. And just another note, um, the preprint link at the bottom here is where you can find a lot of the gory technical details about what I'll be sharing in this presentation. Cool. So I think there's many problems facing the battery industry, a lot of excitement as well, of course, but three big ones that I want to highlight. The first is safety which is in many cases of thermal events that have really these massive human and financial consequences. The second is reliability, which is our ability to ensure that each and every battery pack that we produce can meet its warranty. And the third is manufacturability, which is our ability to make millions of batteries a day at gigafactories all around the world. Let's start with safety. So I'm sure most folks here have seen similar headlines to what I'm showing on the slide that highlight these really vivid battery safety events. The most famous case is probably the Chevy Bolt. So in this case, you know, the entirety of a fleet of something like 100,000 vehicles were recalled. But this is really just the tip of the iceberg. So if you've seen headlines around New York City issues, you know, there's currently this major crisis in New York around e-bike fires. I think something like 200 people died last year with 
um, low quality e-bike batteries catching on fire in apartment buildings and storefronts, et cetera. There's also a lot on like battery fires being very difficult to extinguish. So firefighters around the country and globe are really dealing with the challenge of putting out these like EV fires. So the EV or the, the battery industry really has a lot of work to do to make sure that no EVs blow up in garages and no e-bikes blow up in apartment buildings. And this is critical for public confidence in battery technology. The second big problem is reliability, which is you know specifically battery pack reliability in EVs. So the plot on the left shows the pack level reliability as a function of both the cell level reliability on the y-axis and the number of cells in the pack on the x-axis. So in this plot, we're assuming that a single defective cell can bring down the whole pack. This isn't always the case, but it's possible. So in a simple case, imagine you have all of your cells in series, and if one of these cells has an open circuit failure, your whole pack fails. It's basically Christmas tree lights, uh, or old school Christmas tree lights. Now, if you look at the bottom of this plot, even if we have four nines of cell level reliability, and if we have a pack with 4,000 cells, like a Model 3 or Model Y, you end up with 70% pack, pack level reliability, which is just awful. I mean, it, you can't make money as a EV producer with 70% pack level reliability. Now, you might be tempted to conclude that packs with fewer but larger cells will have better reliability, but keep in mind it's harder to maintain high cell level reliability with these larger cells than it is with smaller cells. So then the problem becomes that pack replacement is very expensive. Uh, my mom sent me this cartoon, so uh, thanks, mom. Um, either the customer has to pay for the new pack, and then your customer has a reaction like the guy in the picture here, or, and then maybe they'll never buy an EV again, or the OEM has to pay for it, or maybe the cell producer has to pay for it, and then you can't make money. Uh, they, you know, you've totally lost your profit margin on the vehicle. So long story short, the need for high pack level reliability makes the requirements for cell level reliability harder by two or three orders of magnitude, basically the number of cells in your pack. And the last issue I'll discuss here is manufacturability, or scaling production. So in my personal opinion, you know, a lot of headlines cover this issue. Um, people are generally aware of manufacturing hell, but it still doesn't get enough attention given how difficult this problem is. The Wall Street Journal had a nice article on this uh, a year or two ago. Um, they're discussing some of the challenges in Panasonic's Gigafactory in Reno. This factory is very high throughput, 40 uh, gigawatt hours. It makes something like 70 cells a second. But based on what we just discussed, nearly all of them have to be defect-free. And you have to avoid defects while minimizing yield, maximizing throughput, and somehow being profitable all at the same time. You kind of have to walk and chew gum and solve differential equations in your head all at the same time. This is like a brutally, brutally hard problem. You know, after spending some time with production issues myself, I'm at some level amazed that we're able to build gigafactories at this scale at all. So the three of us are really worried about this as we start to build gigafactories all over the world. This scalability of battery technology, even vanilla lithium ion technology is, is not easy. So we have these three big problems, safety, reliability, and manufacturability, and all of them have at least one common theme, which is battery quality. I think we all have a rough idea of what this means, but I want to spend some time talking through it to make sure that we're on the same page. So before we get into battery quality, let's take a brief step back and talk about battery failure. So this figure is pretty complicated, and that's really because battery failure itself is absurdly complicated. On the left, the left column there, you can see a bunch of different things that influence battery failure. So cell design, cell quality, cell operating limits, environment, et cetera. Uh, Patrick and I were just at the IBS conference in Florida, and one of the hot topics there was the impact of cell orientation on cell lifetime. So it, it's very clear that battery failure is very subtle and interdependent and just very complicated. But what I really want to highlight in this image is the three severity levels of battery failure. So the yellow box shows performance degradation, which is obviously when the performance of the battery degrades. More or less capacity fade or energy fade is probably the, the most common term for this phenomenon. Capacity fade gets a lot of attention and for sure it's important. I mean, this is one of the biggest blockers for a lot of new battery chemistries that are trying to make it to market. But at the end of the day, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that performance degradation is a crisis in the battery industry the same way that the three things I talked about at the beginning are. 
If you talk to Jeff Don, he knows how to make your battery last a million miles or 4 million miles or wherever it's at today if you need it. So this is possible. We know how to live with performance degradation today. The orange box in the middle shows functional failure, which is defined as when the battery can't meet its functional requirements anymore. I think the three most common examples of this are open circuit failure, closed, uh, sorry, short circuit failure, and then performance degradation, uh, leading to like an E. So severe performance degradation. Now in principle, again, it's not so big of a deal if you lose one cell in a pack with hundreds of thousands, but we just talked about the pack reliability physics that require that every cell that you have in the pack maintains high reliability and doesn't fail. One bad cell can bring down the whole pack. So functional failure is a major concern for ramping cell production. Lastly, the red box in the bottom shows safety events. And this is really the highest severity cause of failure. Here we're kind of defining safety events as anything that threatens human life or the environment. So thermal runaway is a very prominent, well-known root cause of safety events, but other issues like electrolyte leaks or gas fencing can also threaten the human health or the environment as well. So taking a step back, I think there's two big take home messages here. The first is that functional failure and safety events, the orange and red boxes, are really the biggest threats to the industry out of various categories and root causes of battery failure. The second is that battery quality is a prominent root cause for both functional failure and safety events. So we talked about battery failure a bit, but let's kind of cut to the chase. What is battery quality? I think there's two different senses of this term and two different definitions. The first is that no defects are present. So this is probably what comes to mind when you think about poor battery quality sort of colloquially. There's a whole zoo of battery defects that can occur uh, in a battery. The blue box shows open circuit defects and open circuit failure means that there's some break in the electronic connection throughout the cell. Often open circuit defects are related to tabs and terminals and, and things like this. In the orange box on the right, uh, this shows short circuit defects. There's a lot more root causes of short circuit defects since a short can occur anywhere in the jelly roll. Some of these are direct shorts, that's the top row there. So metallic particle contaminants is probably the, the most common or classical uh, canonical root cause of direct shorts. But then there's a variety of plating induced shorts as well. And these, uh, you know, of course, when lithium plating connects the anode and cathode, that can cause a, a dendrite issue. So both open circuit defects and short circuit defects are concerned. But most folks are aware that short circuit defects are a very prominent root cause of thermal runaway. Um, so we're in general most, most concerned about short circuit defects. I think one quick note is there's a lot of discussion now, especially in the context of e-bike fires around counterfeit cells. These cells often have poor quality in this sense of the term where there's often a high rate of defect present in the cell. Now, there's one really important point that I want to make regarding many of these defects, and it's that they're latent defects. So, for example, say that you had a metallic contaminant, foreign particle in your cell. At first, it might not have pierced the separator, and there won't be a short. So electrochemical techniques won't register a signal that the foreign particle has caused a short. It's only after the particle has pierced the separator that a short will occur, and that's only at this point when it's possible to detect the foreign particle via, via electrochemistry. It's in a sense very similar to a tumor, where the tumor the tumor will not show up in your heart rate or blood pressure yet, but it absolutely could cause problems if left if left diagnosed and then can grow. Uh, this example here is for a foreign particle, like a metallic contaminant, but it can absolutely hold for a lithium metal nuclei as well. So by definition of the latent defect. Electrochemical techniques will fail to detect these defects before they're activated. So if we want to catch these defects before they cause problems, we need non-electrochemical techniques in the mix. Okay, so that's one definition of battery quality. The second is much more general, and it's simply conformance. So most battery engineers have heard of this concept as cell-to-cell -cell variability. And manufacturing environments typically refer to this as conformance. So under this definition, poor quality means that there's a large deviation from the design. Of course, you probably didn't design your cell to have defects in it. So the first definition is a subset of this conformance definition. 
Poor conformance has a number of different impacts listed on the slide here. I won't read them all. Some are more severe than others. But I think a key point is that if you have poor conformance, you're missing an opportunity to improve your cell design. So the plot on the right shows two distributions of anode cathode overhead. If you're not familiar with this, it's basically how much anode margin you've added to avoid lithium plating. So in this plot, both distributions are centered at 500 microns. The mean is at 500 microns. But the blue distribution has a standard deviation of 75 microns. If you're able to reduce that standard deviation from 75 to 50 microns, like the green curve, you can squeeze in a fair bit more energy while maintaining the same six sigma limit. Um, the paper gets into this in a lot more detail, but high level improving conformance can lead to some pretty sizable improvements in cell energy. So I think an important thing here is that there's a trade-off between cell performance, cell energy in this case, and cell quality, the margin for safety in this case. And in the real world, you have to always trade off performance and quality, but I don't think this trade-off is well understood today. Okay, so battery quality is for sure an issue. And now we have to think about battery quality control. So this is a pretty simplified overview here. Each of these plots re represents some distribution of cells with respect to some key battery quality parameter like electrode overhead. If you look at the top plot, you can see that we have a problem. 0.5% of the cells in this distribution fall below the lower specification limit. Uh, lower specification limit is LSL for short. In the case of overhang, this might mean that you have a lithium plating risk. You have four options here on the bottom row. And these aren't mutually exclusive, but you have to pick between some combination of these pathways. Option one is to expand the spec limits. So in the dating world, this is often known as lowering your standards. And in other words, you might decide that we can decrease the LSL for overhang from 30 microns to 15 microns. Now, this isn't always as bad as it sounds. You might realize that the spec limits that you set for a 25-year energy storage system are actually way too conservative for an e-bike or toothbrush application. But if you do this, you're, of course, adding risk. Option two is to shift the mean of your distribution. So you might decide to increase the design target for overhang. This is actually the opposite of what we discussed on the previous slide. Now you're decreasing your cell energy in exchange for lower risk. It might be the right decision, but it's going to come at a cost. Option three is to tighten the distribution or improve your performance. Now in principle, this has no downsides. Now all of your cells are more uniform. But in practice, you know, the poor conformance could come from anywhere in the factory. So there's probably 10,000 knobs that you tuned in the factory and you really don't wanna to have to convince anyone on the production team that we need to do more process development or some uncertain payoff that may or may not work. So this is great if possible, but it's often a wild goose chase in practice. The last option is to improve inspection. So this is very closely linked with all of the others in that you need good inspection in order to make any of these decisions or conclusions at all. Adding inspection, of course, adds cost and maybe time, but it can really unlock some essential insights into your production. And so better inspection has a really important role to play in the battery quality challenge. All right, so let's talk about inspection a bit. There's a couple key items here. The first, if you want to look at 100% of your cells, or if you want to, if you're okay doing sampling-based inspection, we get this question a lot. Actually, the short answer is that sampling strategies have been developed in various production settings, automotive, uh, appliances, you name it, for over a century now. So as long as you can sample intelligently across your production equipment and processes, you can very often root cause the issues that were caused by a single mistake like say a contaminated batch of material. So the summary here is that there's a place for both approaches, full inspection and sampling-based inspection and battery quality control. The second consideration in developing an inspection strategy is your test location. Where do you put the inspection test? Again, there's no right answer. It really depends on what you're trying to do in the factory. If you put your inspection tests upstream, you'll have less waste because you can scrap that material before it continues to the downstream process. If you put your inspection tests downstream, you can be much more confident that you've caught all of the defective batteries that you made, uh, which is great, but you're gonna have more scrap. 
So often the right decision is to add lots of inspection checkpoints throughout your entire process. And the last element in instruction strategy is what techniques to use. Uh, so this table outlines some key parameters and key requirements of different characterization techniques. And the rows are different methods. So the top half of the table here is all electrochemical methods. I love electrochemistry. I know Patrick loves electrochemistry. Everyone loves electrochemistry. Batteries are electrochemical devices. You absolutely need electrochemistry in your factory, in your lab, et cetera, to detect quality issues. That said, electrochemistry is not spatially resolved, or at least in standard use cases. And you need some spatial resolution to detect these uh, defects that could cause problems down the road, especially the latent defects. So while electrochemistry is great and is absolutely not giving away from battery quality control, it's not a sufficient uh, set of techniques for this problem. The next two rows are dissection and cross-section. These are both great when people should do it. Uh, these are both destructive techniques that take a long time to, to do and absolutely not scalable to the to the thousands of cells that you need to measure for battery quality control. In mind vision, again, also great. Um, one major limitation is you can't see inside an assembled cell, of course, uh, by definition. So it's limited to pre-assembly checks. Again, still great, but not a comprehensive solution. Acoustics are also great. I'm not at all here to, to bash acoustics. I think more people should do it as well. Um, it has just one key limitation, which is the resolution. So often the resolution is limited to 500 microns or one millimeter. Um, it's still an amazing technique for electrolyte wetting detection and a variety of other defects, um, but it can't quite catch these electro scale defects that often cause problems. Okay, so that leaves two rows left, 2D X-ray imaging and 3D X-ray imaging. 2D X-ray imaging is widely used today in battery quality control and in production. Um, again, great technique, more people should use it. Um, the problem is you get a superposition of your entire battery uh, throughout the path of the X-ray. And you know, small defects like particles, uh, like wrinkles, et cetera, can't be detected with 2D imaging. The last is 3D imaging. I'll be talking about this extensively uh, throughout the rest of the talk. Um, but in our opinion, this sort of checks all of the key boxes that are needed for a battery quality control technique. Um, but to overemphasize this point, uh, we absolutely need all these techniques for battery quality control. I don't think it's worthwhile to pit these against each other. Uh, this is a hard problem, very hard problem. We should throw everything we have at it to try to solve it. Okay, I think I'll pause there for a sec, Austin, if there's any questions, and if not, I'll keep going. Yeah, this is fantastic. Um, I have a few questions of my own, but I think you're probably yeah. going to answer them with your next few slides. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'll hold them, and I don't see any audience questions yet, so... Um, Say, so let's keep going. Sounds great. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we think CT is awesome. What's CT? Uh, CT was invented around 1970, uh, give or take a couple of years, and it got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1979. If you've ever broken a bone, you've probably had a CAT scan. Uh, safe technology is a CAT scan, and if you've ever taken a flight in the past 20 years, you've probably had airport security screening. Safe technology is uh, baggage inspection as well. High level in CT, um, we have an x-ray source and an x-ray detector and an object that's in the path of the x-ray beam. What we do is we um, put the object on a stage, we rotate the stage around, and we take a sequence of 2D images uh, via the x-ray detector. We then do a, or apply a computer algorithm called CT reconstruction. And what this, does, what this does is it converts a sequence of 2D images into a 3D volume that we can analyze down the road. Uh, so that's sort of the basics of CT. Here's an example of a battery CT scan. So high level in CT, the contrast comes from radio density, which is, for our intents and purposes, basically atomic number. So you can see here that components of the battery with high atomic number have uh, high contrast or very bright. So the steel can, the copper tab, all show up as very bright components in the battery here. And then lower Z components, such as uh, the core, which is a 
uh, from the design of anything or the anode have less contrast, low, uh, darker in this image. One thing that I think is very uh, great, one thing that's great about CT is that it's readily interpretable. Uh, so, you know, I can look at this image or you can look at this image without a strong background in how to interpret CT images and get a sense of what's happening, right? It looks like a battery, you, you recognize it as a jelly roll, et cetera. I think, you know, Patrick and I have spent enough time squinting at the QDB curves to uh, <laughs> try to understand what's happening there. And, you know, for sure it's a great technique, but um, I think this is important for bringing more folks into the battery quality challenge. So if you're scaling a factory, you need more people to quickly understand what's happening in your factory without having, you know, years of experience trying to understand what's happening via electric chemistry. So we are not at all claiming to have, you know, pioneered CT for batteries. Uh, this has been done for 10, 15 years now. Um, the paper on the left here is from, I think, Paul Shearing's group. Uh, Paul Shearing's group's done a lot of amazing work on CT for batteries. The paper on the right is from Exponent, again, also a, really a pioneer in using CT for battery failure analysis. So people have been doing this technique for a long time, but primarily this happens in R&D and failure analysis settings. Um, again, super valuable. Um, the most, a, a very common study is to take a couple cells, scan them at the beginning of life, and then scan them throughout the whole process of cycling and, and see how the uh, jelly roll and cell mechanics evolve. Um, this is great. This is more in sort of an R&D failure analysis setting. If we want to take this technique and convert it to a production technique, there's a couple of big limitations, but they primarily revolve around speed. So if you read these papers, typically the scans take on the order of hours, sometimes even 24 hours. Um, and really that's where Glimpse comes in. Our mission is to, our, our objective is to reduce the time to analyze and scan CT batteries, and CT scans of batteries. So the first element here is to improve the scan time, bring it down as low as possible while still maintaining high image quality. I'm personally not a photographer, but I've aware, I'm aware of enough photographers that I think this whole process is not too different from photography. There's three, three key components to improving the scan time. The first is optimized hardware. So this is a combination of finding the right X-ray source, X-ray detector, uh, and even subtle things like fixturing can play a big role in the image quality that you can obtain. The second component is the scan recipe. So again, just like photography, there's exposure times, there's uh, source currents, source voltages, positions, et cetera. And there's really this whole menu of dozens of parameters that can be tuned to optimize the scan recipe and image quality. The last element is a bit of the glimpse secret sauce here. So this is what we call image enhancement. So there's a number of corrections and noising steps that we can take to uh, bring down the scan time while maintaining high image quality. So our standard cylindrical cell scans take around two minutes a day. And again, that's via a combination of all three of these steps. Two minutes a day is exciting for a lot of applications. It's not quite where we need to be for a production setting. Um, we're working on some next generation hardware with our partners that will take the scan time here from two minutes to around 10 to 15 seconds while maintaining high image quality. People often ask, can we go faster? Can we go slower? Uh, the answer is always yes. Uh, we can we can tune anything here. Um, but the core or one of the core challenges in CT is to trade off scan time and image quality. And these two components are always in tension. Um, our goal really is to break the Pareto front so that this optimization front can be tuned for a given customer need. Um, but of course, the needs given needs for a customer will depend on sort of your exact interest. Okay, so that's all in scan time. So again, we're trying to drive down scan time as fast as we can while still maintaining high image quality. If we get to 10 seconds of scan, which we're confident we'll be able to do next year, uh, we're gonna have a lot of data. The question then becomes, how do we quickly extract insights from it? And how do we learn what's happening in, in our batteries with 10 seconds of, uh, per scan worth of data? I did a fair bit of CT in grad school. Uh, the old way to do this is to is very painful and slow and you know works okay for a couple cells, but not great for hundreds or thousands or eventually millions of cells. So the old way without reading the slide in detail basically involves 
bringing a hard drive around with you from the lab to the fancy computer, using the fancy software, zooming around. And at the end of the day, after an hour's worth of work, you end up with a couple screenshots that you can use for a meeting uh, or an email. If you present this work in a meeting and someone wants to see what's happened just below the screenshot that you took, you have to repeat this process over again. Again, this works if you really want to deep dive a couple cells. Uh, you can you can really understand what's happening in fine detail at that level, um, but not at all scalable for the high throughput that you need for battery production. With Glimpse, it's a different process. So you can acquire tens or hundreds or thousands or eventually millions of scans with CT hardware that's optimized for batteries. So that again, uh, sort of takes you to the next level. Step two here is to is what we do. So this happens automatically. As a user, you don't even need to touch it. We automatically process the scan to enhance its image quality uh, with a specialized compute. So something Patrick spends a lot of his time thinking about is how do we process scans even faster and make sure we can keep up with the scan time. Um, this is each scan is order dozens of gigabytes, uh, again, per scan. So if we're doing this every two minutes or let alone every 10 seconds, um, this is almost a mini high performance computing problem in a third byte. It, it's not a trivial task at all. Uh, step three here is to automatically inspect the images for defects and key measurements. So this is where computer vision algorithms come in. So we take the images and we look for various quality features of interest and, and defects of interest as well. Finally, instead of having one fancy computer that only a couple engineers can use to view this data, uh, we put the data on a web app. So now anyone in your organization can view this data. I can take a scan myself, send it to Patrick. Uh, Patrick can send it to Austin. And anyone in your organization that's authorized can view this data and make sense of it. And now the entire factory or, or lab or what have you can make sense of this data quickly and participate in the battery quality control improvement process. One of the key, maybe the key driving uh, metric and so we're sort of OKR for our engineering decision making is we want to minimize the time to insights for our customers. So that really comes from a combination of the two slides we just presented. The first is the fast scan time, so you can quickly scan as many batteries as you as you're able to. And the second is fast analysis time. So quickly understanding everything that's happening in your batteries without manually reviewing every scan in the basement of some lab, like I did in grad school. Um, we've created this web app called the Glimpse Portal, which is really Glimpse's battery quality monitoring platform. So the left image here shows scan our scan viewer. So you can quickly review a single scan, it takes a couple seconds to load, and you can slide through various views of the battery to understand what's happening. The colors that you see on the images here are uh, computer vision overlays, so these are you know, the, the right image there is actually the overhang, which is a sort of canonical battery quality metric that you can then see for yourself and understand what the algorithm is actually measuring for you. The right image is almost sort of the holy grail of what all the work we've been talking about is leading towards. This is a statistical process control view of what you see in your factory. So this is, I think, around a couple hundred cells. This is real data. And this is a view of, in this case, core circularity as a function of every cell that you've scanned in this, in this batch. And really the goal is you can see this data, look for outliers, look for averages, see how these trends drift with time. And ultimately you can correlate this quality data with all of your production data. So if you see that your core circularity, for instance, has gotten worse, you can correlate that with certain lots of material, certain winders, certain process steps, and make sure you can quickly root cause what's actually happening in your factory and make it better. So all of this is really built for scale, where you know the, the key use case that is sort of our North Star is this high throughput production environment where you're making millions of cells a day. Um, and we have plenty of work to do till, till we're truly at that level, but we're, we're getting pretty close. Um, to kind of showcase what we're trying to do here, we created a 1,000 cell demo. If you go to the URL at the bottom of the screen here, you can play around with this data for yourself. Uh, so if we scan 1,000 cells, there's some vanilla uh, lithium ion batteries, 18250, 2170, also some 4680s uh, that we were able to find online, um, a couple pouch prismatics, some sodium ions as well. 
So a variety of different battery types here. Hopefully some battery nerds here will get, get a kick out of it. Uh, we also open source the whole data set. So we hope more folks get excited by what CT can do for batteries and play around with the data set and see what they can learn. Um, I'm going to keep the sales stuff to a minimum here, but high level, we have two business models, just in case you're interested, uh, scan on demand and on-premise scanning, scan on demand, send us batteries, we'll scan them and put a link to the data online. On-premise scanning, uh, we'll set up a scanner on site for you or use your existing scanner and we'll design the image quality, hardware stack, software stack, et cetera, to meet your needs. Um, Battery CT can be used all, all throughout the entire sort of cell life cycle, so all the way from cell design all the way through second life. Um, so while, again, while I talk a lot about high throughput CT for production, this is still absolutely useful for you if you're doing qualification, if you're doing second life, or anywhere, anywhere in between. I think we're a little short on time. I uh, briefly want to acknowledge the Glimpse founding team. So uh, we're small but mighty. Uh, I think really enjoyed working with everyone so far and everything you see here so far has not been possible without everyone in this picture. Wrapping up real quick, battery quality is among the most difficult issues facing the industry and it's really due to the key challenges of um, safety, reliability, and manufacturability. Improving battery quality inspection is one promising path forward and among the various techniques that can help with quality inspection, CT is one of the, the most prominent. And it sort of checks all the boxes to make sure that we can uh, solve these, this challenge for ourselves. Glimpse's mission is to enable battery quality at scale. And we're doing this by driving down both the scan time and the analysis time of battery CT. Cool. Uh, so this is just right. a page of resources. So if you're curious about learning more about battery quality or seeing our data set, that's the first two links here. And the rest of the links are more about Glimpse as a company. That's about all I have. Uh, I think I went a little over, but thanks for your time. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Um, by the way, your platform is beautiful, and I love I love the G. That's also you know a jelly roll. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very yeah. Eric gets credit for this one. It's, uh, right <laughs> yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I, there's a few questions that just came in, but it, they're yeah. kind of related to the question that I had been thinking about, which is, yeah. um, uh, I, I think there's a there's a very interesting sort of um, uh, similarity, I think, between Aionics and Glimpse, which is um, we're both, in some sense, uh, thinking about, well, if you think of the of a battery as like a very simplified version of a human body, right, we have all these technologies that we can use to solve problems with human bodies. Uh, batteries are very complicated, but much more simple than human bodies, right? So um, we're working on essentially, you know, the drug discovery side of this piece, and you're working on the, you know, the X-ray side of this piece, the imaging side of this piece. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's it seems like the fact that we can do this for humans, much more complicated, means that we must be able to do this for batteries. Um, it hasn't been done though, and you're the first to do it. And so I'm I'm curious um, uh, as my first just sort of reflection is. Um, what do you think is that, like, why has this not been done? And, and kind of what are those key um, milestones or developments that um, you are focusing on that will, you know, get us to the point where we all say, well, duh, we should have done this 20 years ago, right? Um, what, what, what are the, how, how do you see that kind of evolving, I guess? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I guess, I, I think, Fundamentally, it's been it's just been the advance in the compute resources that are available. Because um, a lot of CT basically boils down to how much data you can get and how quickly you can process it and and analyze it. And you know, up until uh, up until relatively recently, that just wasn't possible. Um, you know, uh, twenty years ago, there there wasn't the computational capability. To make it possible to run the scan and then have some results in a few minutes, you would have the, the the compute resources would have been enormous. And so I think the the main thing that has changed is it's now possible for us to um, acquire those images very very quickly because you know detectors and, and and panels and things like that have gotten a lot better. Um, 
it's able, uh, you know, the rise of the rise of GPUs, um, to be honest, has been part of it as well, because then we're able to process this data. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things. Um, uh, yeah, th th there's a lot of other things, you know, in even after the reconstruction that uh, benefit from increased, uh, you know, computational power. So I think the, the fundamental thing that has changed is just computers, <laughs> which is true yeah. for a lot of things. Um, yeah. But it's, I, I think, one of, the, one of the things to look for here. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think also both of you deserve a lot of credit for, for changing the culture too, right? I think a few years ago, there was a sense that, well, you know, what does data and AI have to do with batteries? There's nothing for us to do here, right? And, and computing and all these things. And through your work, through, you know, Stanford, TRI, uh, Tesla, I think that's, you've been key drivers of that realization that, hey, there, there is a role for, um, for AWS and for machine learning and GPUs and NVIDIA chips and all these things. Um, which is really cool. I want to uh, stay on the on the um, medical uh, comparisons um, and ask the first um, audience uh, uh, question, which is um, so the question is in the field of uh, disease and AI, models are often trained on images of say good organs and diseased organs. Um, uh, the the question is here it appears you're only training on good cells, but you want the model to be able to to you know dif differentiate good from bad. So um, is there utility on, can you talk about that? And then is there utility on training on specific types of defects? Yeah, good question. I'll take a first shot at it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's a great question. There's a lot of, yeah, the analogy breaks down at some point. And, uh, you know, part of it is for humans, there's a general class of tumors and, and disease that, can it's universal for across all humans, right? Um, in batteries, one challenge is generalizability, and this is you know a classic challenge in AI. Um, one open question is, you know, if we find defects or train a model that can detect defects in, say, twenty one seventy sodium cells, um, how well will that translate to detecting diseased organs, so to speak, in LFP prismatic cells? Um, that generalizability is for sure an open question um, where we have ideas on how to tackle it and excited to tackle it. Um, but I think the general the universality of battery defects across the variety of cell types and form factors, chemistries, et cetera, is maybe an open question. And frankly, no one has data yet to understand if that's true or not because CT hasn't existed at the scale yet. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would also say that there are, um, uh, oftentimes it's not a matter of just saying, it, it's not a matter of like making a binary decision, like that there's some there's a there's a problem or there's not a problem. Um, oftentimes, what you're doing is you're characterizing the, um, you're you're fitting across a continuum, right? You you have a, you have a lot of different, um, and so you could say that there is some threshold at which like we think that this is a problem, and if you are if you're building a model, then oftentimes you can say like, okay, the model is valid over this range, and then you know there's some problem once you go beyond this point, and so that allows you to a little bit more flexibility um, in terms of uh, in terms of like having you know having to try to build a, a fully balanced data set. It makes sense. So the, the next question is is related to this. So uh, this is from Norman. So bringing the Tesla perspective here. Um, so, uh, do you, so how do you, um, how do you kind of tune for those different parameters across different cell designs, um, uh, tab locations, pore size, slash shape, et cetera, form factor? Um, do you have to sort of train individual models for different cell designs? Is that something you can kind of generalize over? Um, maybe both. Um, how are you thinking about that? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I think this is uh, this is you know kind of at the core of how we build and construct our software. Um, we need to you know we need to be able to um, understand like what is different and what is the same. Um, and so you know we go through a lot of work actually to um, build something that is the most general thing that we can um, the most general thing that we can have. Um, 
and then make some minor tweaks, some minor improvements in order to um, in order to allow our software to work efficiently on uh, you know on some on some variant. Um, and I think that applies pretty well across almost everything that we're doing. You know, different uh, different cell chemistries, different form factors. Um, different scanning uh, recipes and different like um, different you know scanner types even. So yeah, trying to look for the trying to look for the commonalities. I guess the other thing I would say is uh, CT data has the advantage that it is all images and image formats. I think are one of the best. Uh, the one of the things that has been most commonly agreed upon in terms of format and what you should display. And so it's a lot easier to work with. And exactly what you're getting is a little bit, uh, is a little bit easier to understand. Makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, sorry, what was that? Yeah, no, totally, totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the, uh, so keeping one thread of that, which was the Tesla uh, comment. Um, so I'm curious how, um, how your team having been you know at a large or like I should say plural large corporate um, you know companies who are involved in the manufacturing and the scaling and the deployment and design of these uh, batteries um, and seeing that from that perspective versus now being a small startup um, how do you like I guess it, it was it's kind of obvious that you know as you as you talked Peter about the the deep kind of industry experience that you, like you've seen these things happen. And so that's informed your perspective, but I'm just curious kind of how you think about like um, the role of startups versus uh, these large companies who are, you know, presumably your, your customers doing most of the manufacturing. Um, uh, yeah, just, it's sort of a general question, but what's, what's the role for startups versus large corporates, et cetera. Yeah. Good question. I mean, as a, you know, sub 10 person startup, we're never going to be the folks that can make batteries at the gigawatt hour scale, right? So we're always going to have a complementary role to play to the companies that can do that. And that requires you know, tremendous resources. Um, Tesla has got a special place in my heart in that I think it's, you know, retained the core sort of startup culture and vibe while, you know, still being at massive scale. So, you know, it's hard to replicate and we'll do the best we can at, at Glimpse. Um, I do think there's key strategic maybe gaps or niches that we can fill as a startup that um, require a lot of focus and energy and uh, maybe a different skill set than what a large corporate typically has. So for instance, you know, Tesla aside, just in general, I think the battery industry, uh, the large players in the battery industry don't have the sort of core software expertise that is sort of required to build this sort of system from scratch. And that's where, you know, folks like Patrick come in. Um, I think, and presumably the risk tolerance too, right? To yeah. to try these crazy ideas, right, right, yeah. And I think, you know, on a personal note, I've benefited a lot from having you know the, the past year to be very focused and uh, really get into the technical weeds of things, you know, with Patrick and with the rest of the team to sort of build this product from the ground up. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, we are just about out of time, um, so I will see if anyone has any final questions. Um, I, maybe I'll ask what I, I I sort of alluded to at the very beginning, which is the um, the long term uh, vision. So there's clearly there's impact here in in the world of batteries. Um, is you know how do you see the the company growing? Do you see yourself going very you know deep vertically in in batteries? Do you see yourself kind of widening out into different kinds of materials? Um, how are you thinking about that? There's plenty of business to be had in batteries, I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think it just, uh, you know, it, it depends on, on where things, on where things go. Uh, you know, right now we're very focused on, uh, trying to deliver, I think the best technical, the, the best technical product that we can, um, and make sure that we make sure that we build that to build that to the best of our ability that we try to make it as generalizable as possible, as powerful as possible. And you know, the um, applications or, you know, exactly how that evolves is a little bit of an open question, honestly. Um, and, you know, as you said, one of the benefits of, of, of a startup is that you get to, you get to try out these things um, and you get to make experiments and, and, uh, and 
occasionally make mistakes and then, you know, move on to whatever's next. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're really focused on building, um, I think something that is, we know is useful for the problems that we have seen. Um, and then trying to make it as general as possible, you know, in the, especially in the extent that we can make it easy for us to, um, easy for us to deliver these kinds of insights into the batteries. Um, and so, I mean, you know, there, there's other areas where that might be useful and we'll, we'll see where, we'll see where things go. And like my answer to that is, you know, the three of us are really battery nerds at heart. Uh, we hope we can help everyone in the battery industry solve their battery quality problems, but you never know where the wind will take you. So we'll see what happens in a couple of years. Awesome. Well, with, with that, I think, uh, you know, everyone's really excited to see, uh, this, uh, see where you go and see this journey unfold. And, um, thank you for, for joining us today. This is great to hear about what you're doing. Thanks yeah. for having us, Austin. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Of course. Thanks for joining us and uh, everyone who listened in. Thank you. And we will see everyone probably not in a fortnight, uh, but uh, <laughs> at the next one. So <laughs> thanks again, guys. Thank you. Take care, Austin.